I haven't sang this song in a minute, so if I mess up, I apologize. woes. 
I first of all see uh, that the woe of the desires, that ones that are covetous, that are going house to house, or taking houses and, and lands, and they're adding lands and abusing the land. There is a woe to that thing of covetousness. I will say this and I'll say it again. Capitalism without constraint uh, promotes covetousness. Now you and I better understand that. That is why if nobody, if they don't care about the people around them, guess what people do? They just want to hoard and hoard and hoard and then lord and lord and lord. When they have it and they own it, then they take advantage of the land and they'll take advantage of the people. Say it's not so. Say it's not so. You better study history. That's why the land word land lord got started. Because they were lording over the land. Because there was no constraint. And I am not against capitalism. I am warning though about the woe of the desires, those that are covetous. They are marred by sin. And then there's the woe of the demoralized that we'll see in verses 11 through 16. We can find their drink. We'll find their dance. We'll find their debauchery. And can I say God has a problem with the way these people were operating, the way they were acting. They were demoralized. They were drinking strong drink and wine. Uh, they were getting drunk. They were, they were drunkards. And I will say this, they were not alcoholics. God calls them drunkards. He doesn't call them drunks. He calls them drunkards. They drank alcohol and became demoralized. What did they do after that? They turned the music on. And we will find that they had their musical instruments going. And you know what happens when they got the musical instruments going? You're drunk, you start dancing. And then it inflamed them. They went into debauchery. He said, I don't believe that. You better read uh, Genesis or Exodus 32. Mm -hmm. I will tell you this. They were mastered by sin. They were marred by sin when there was the woe of the being desirous. But now they're mastered by sin. Sin has taken over their life. But then he gives a woe of the disrespectful. The woe of the disrespectful. We'll see in verse number 18. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin with, as it were, a cart rope that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. They're saying, oh yeah. We're doing this and God, well let God do it. If he can come down, okay. If God's for it, let him bring him down from that cross. They mock. And can I say the world does that? Not only do I find the woe of the disrespectful, but the, the woe of the devilish. They call evil good and good evil. They start saying, hey, sin is okay and those that are against it are the bad guys. And certainly we've gotten there in our society. But not only do I see that, I see the, 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 the woe of the deceived in verse number 21. Woe are them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. They think that, hey, let them have their way and sin and it'll be okay. Everything will be all right. Just let everybody do what they want to do, be what they want to be, go where they want to go, and everything will be all right. No restraints, no constraints. Why? In their own conceit, they're deceived. But then there's the woe of the despicable. Let me say the woe of the, the devilish, or they magnify sin. They call evil good and good evil. The woe of the deceived, they are misled by sin. They think it'll just it'll go away if you just let it go. It will not. It'll get worse. But then there's the woe of the despicable. 
They minister to sin. Their power comes from saying, it's okay. It's all right. Do what you want to do. They promote it. They minister to sin. If we find that in verse 22, they're mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink. They can do that. They do that. They, 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 they're mighty enough. They can do all that. But here's what they do. They justify the wicked for what? Not because they think it's okay, but so they can keep their position. They can keep their power. They can keep their prestige for reward. They say, we're going to get behind it and we're going to push it. It's going to be what we do because these are our constituents. And there are those out there that are totally in their own personal life not living in these lifestyles so much. But they are promoting those lifestyles because those lifestyles keep them in power. They keep them in places of prestige. They keep them popular. They won't get voted out. The people won't go against them. You say that's not true. That's not the way it is. That's not the way it has ever been. These were God's elect people. And not only were the God's elect people Israel, but these were God's elite people. This was Judah and Jerusalem. And they had found themselves in that way. Is it not wild? Is it not wicked? Starts out just wild. We're just doing what we want to do. But then it gets to wickedness where people are taking advantage of them, deceiving their own selves, to deceived by heart, by the sequence of sin. I'm talking about these ones that are just keeping on going, and, and that their, their whole power now, their whole prestige is built upon this. It is a sad state of affairs. It happened to them, and it is happening to us. A nation that was founded on Christian principles. That most of those in this nation were, quote unquote, some kind of Christian. But now, if you look at where we're at, there's a word. And God's going to bring judgment because of it. Let me say this. All that being said, I thank God for chapter 6 and the woe of chapter 6. Because it is a wonderful woe. It is the woe of delight. And I want to deal with that this morning just for a, a few moments. Because during the reign of, of Uzziah, Isaiah was seeing a vision of sinfulness of society. But now in chapter 6, he does not see the sinfulness of society but he sees the sinfulness of self. And can I say it's a good day when you see the sinfulness of self. Do you remember the first time you saw the sinfulness of self and it got you some help when you ran to the Lord with it? Can I tell you? Oh, that's when you got born again. A man does not get saved until he sees the sinfulness of self. He does not get saved just because he believed that Jesus was a good guy. Or even that Jesus died on the cross. Or that Jesus shed his blood for the sins of the whole world. But until he comes to the place where he sees sin as exceeding sinful and sees himself a sinner, he will never see a need for a Savior. It's a day of woe of delight. I will say this, Isaiah, for his first five chapters, has been preaching to these ones about their sinfulness and about the judgment of God that is going to happen. I believe Isaiah was a saved man per se. I believe Isaiah was a good man. But I believe Isaiah had come had a shortcoming. And I believe when he sees his shortcoming, it helped him out. The first time he ever saw himself as sinful, he got saved. 
But can I say that's not the last time you see yourself as sin. And it was not the last time you saw himself as sin. Because he was a prophet under Isaiah, at least according to chapter 1, he was a prophet under Isaiah. And this is talking about the year that King Isaiah died. When he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. As a prophet to the palace, he may have seen himself as somewhat. How that's a word that Paul says, they seem to be somewhat in conference. They're men of esteem. They think of themselves as high. They think of themselves as holy. They think of themselves as somewhat. I'm a somebody in the ministry. I'm a somebody at work. I'm a somebody. Can I say, as a prophet to the palace, the one who wrote more uh, things that were quoted in the New Testament than all the other prophets put together. He's a somebody. He may have thought himself as a somewhat, as Paul would use to say about people. The tendency is to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Have you ever realized that that's what happens you sit there and you, you get to be a position of power or prestige. Oh, if somebody, I mean, you, let me say, Uzziah is your cousin. At least that's what they say. That's what the Jewish history says. His daddy, Amos, was King, was King Am, uh, Amaziah's brother. I think it was Amaziah. Uh, that, he, he was the brother of the king who was Uzziah's daddy. You know what that makes these two? He's cousins with the king. You want to know why it meant something when Uzziah died? Because all of a sudden, he lost his place in the palace. He didn't have a cousin. He couldn't just say, Cuz, they're giving me a hard time when I'm preaching this stuff. Cuz! He couldn't walk in to the palace. Or he could not go and say, tell Jotham when Uzziah was over there in the several house because he had uh, went and sinned. He couldn't go and say to Jotham, listen, I'll go talk to your dad about this. Jotham was reigning in his stead, but uh, Uzziah was still the king. You know this. He couldn't do that when Uzziah's dead. Who is he now? See, he had a place of prestige. The tendency is to more think more highly than we ought, not to think solely, realizing that God has dealt every man the measure of faith. God had given him that place. God had done all this. God had let him have all the uh, prestige that he had, all the power that he had. God had given him this measure. God had given him this position as a prophet to the past. The king was his cousin. Amaziah was, uh, was Amos's father's brother. Now his cousin's crown is no longer his safety, no longer security. Have you read what verses chapters 1 through 5? Did you read him in chapter 5? I mean, he's pronouncing woes on these people, saying God's about to bring judgment on you. And now his safety, his security is gone. Oh, you say, oh, he should have been trusting in the Lord. Let me say, I know a lot of good Christians that would be devastated if all of a sudden their employer said we're shutting down. And there is nothing for you left. Before there was unemployment. Before there was anything else. If that employer just came up to you and said, we're closing this business. You've been saying, I've been trusting God. I've been trusting God. And then all of a sudden they say you're closing the business and all you're saying, how are we going to get away? How are we going to do this? How are we going to pay the bills? I've got a house note. Hold on, I've got a car note. Hold on. You say it doesn't happen? You haven't been around much. Half of America was pulling their hair out when COVID happened. I even found myself like that for a day or two 
when enterprise shut down. You say, why? Because I was so used to everything being just going like it was going. And then all of a sudden, I thought I was living all out for God. But my security, how I thought God was going to take care of me the rest of my life until he raised up a, a large enough church here that could pay me, I mean, as much as Joel Osteen makes. Mm. <laughs> From his books. I mean, if I wrote a couple of books that told a bunch of lies, I could say, I could probably make me some money too. Amen. 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 You say, ah, oh, you putting down Joel Osteen? Yes. Amen. Amen. I ain't putting down Joel Osteen. You say, why? Because he's a liar, liar, pants on fire with a telephone nose as long as a wire. I ain't talking about, I would have said nose as long as a telephone wire, but we know that phones don't have wires anymore. Right. He's deceiving people. He's a wicked man. I'm not preaching, I'm not, I ain't got time to preach on all that, but I will tell you this. When your security, your safety is gone, and he's not preaching a popular message. And he's needing a, a he's, but God knows you're needing the next level of newness in your relationship with me. You need a, to get to the next level. How's it going to happen? By ripping out the rug from underneath you. Because you're not going to say, well, let me tell you, I'm just going to do this all on my own. And rip the rug out from underneath you. Until God does something to show you you need to do that. I remember months praying. Dear God, are you sure? I mean, I, I was I was a zealot and I was, I was ready to quit my job the second God told us to go with the Rock of Ages prison ministry. But you know, when it came closer to time to quit my job, there was things inside of me saying, and I'm saying, dear God, how am I going to pay this house? No, well, God raised up the buyer for the house. And even when I went on the road, I still had one more house note to pay. And I'm like, how am I going to pay that last house note? I'm broke. I'm on the road. And guess what happened? They paid me for an extra week of vacation. Why? I called my boss and said, I need to give you this money back. He said, no, I'll keep it. Don't worry about it. We got enough money in this company. Don't worry about it. I said, well, hallelujah. Pay my house note. That's right. He said, you, you, I mean, I, don't, I know you don't ever worry. I know you don't ever get fretful. Amen. I know y'all aren't like me. I'm the only one that's, y'all are not men of like passion like me. I'm the only one that's ever like that. Amen. That's where Isaiah was. He was cousins with the king. His safety and security, everything was going wrong. At least I'm the cousin of the king. You're not going to kill the king's cousin. I mean, how would you feel if all your earthly security were gone and all you had was God? That's Isaiah chapter 6. So three things that Isaiah sees in this wonderful world that we all need to see if we're going to fulfill all God's will for our life. Number one, he saw his malformity. Number two, he saw his majesty. And number three, he saw his ministry. And I will say that, his malformity. You'll notice it in verse number five. It says, I am undone. Woe is me, for I am undone. He saw two things he was undone in. Number one, he was undone because of his conversation. Number two, he was undone because of his cry. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Let me tell you, he was not talking about the people he was preaching against. He was talking about the people he was hanging out with. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. That's my conversation. And my friends that I fellowship with, they're the same way I am. 
We can go and talk about everybody else and we never search our own self and see what's in our own self. That's who Isaiah was. When all the glitter is gone and you, fall, and you come face to face with God's glorious grace, we'll see ourselves as woeful. Can I say, and that's wonderful. Because until you see yourself as woeful, you'll never be able to experience all that God has for you. Amen. In me, as in my flesh, what a no good thing. We'll see sin exceeding sinful in ourselves. See, he saw himself the same as he saw society now. He saw that they like prestige, they like power, they like plenty, they like play. And Isaiah said, huh, I've been able to play at this thing being a prophet. And I'm not saying what a prophet, because I've always had the prestige. I've always had the position. I've always had plenty. I wasn't going to lose it all. I'm a cousin to the king. And now, he realizes he's just like me. And he deserves everything they deserve. The captivity that he's preached about they're going into, I am too. The captivity that he preached that, you deserve, that they deserve, he said, I am too. I do too. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I talk one thing, and I live clean. I live right compared to them, but not right compared to myself to the king, eternal, immortal. Invisible, the only wise God. That is why I think it was in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We could say, we could preach against the adultery. We could preach against the idolatry. But can I say, when it gets right down to the nitty gritty and we preach against the murmuring, people start saying, Whoa, it's me! Because I'm as guilty as everybody else. And those that murmur, God's people were destroyed and destroyed for murmuring. See, it's easy when you're preaching against the debauchery, the drink, and the dance, or the hyper covetous, or those who sell their soul so that they can have power and position. But when you start realizing, you like the same stuff of your status that they like. When everything's falling apart on you, where are you? Where am I? He liked the position of power as the prophet. He liked the place of popularity and, and the prestige as the, the cousin of the king. Some inside of him had allowed his, his flesh had allowed him to become proud and presumptuous. It's never going to change. Everybody's going to always love me because I saw a body. Can I tell you, that is what Matthew 7 is dealing with when Matthew 7 deals with the idea of exposing others' sin before examining self's sin. We know that, that everybody knows this verse. Judge not that you be not judged. And they stop right there. The world stops right there and tells you judge not. But he says, for with the same judgment you judge, you shall be judged with the same measure you meet, it shall be measured you again. And why behold thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how would thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold a beam is in thine own eye? I mean, examine yourself. See, are you judging a uh, righteous judgment? Have you examined yourself? Are you seeing clearly to be able to help these people? Or are you just going out there and prophesying and telling them they're about their sin just because you...